Hello, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. And reading through the YouTube chat here before we got the show started, um, first of all, hello to everyone watching, hello to Adi, hello, hello, glad to have you guys here. But also, very exciting news, I think this is the first ever confirmed case, Raito Yagami has confirmed that he was below 2000 before he started watching the series, and he is now above 2000. So there you go. Proof it works. Proof the method works. Um, anyways, tonight we're going to be going over some very exciting games. Of course, right now the world has kind of stopped, but chess has not. There are a ton of super fun online events with some of the, the world's best players still going on. Right now, chess.com is actually hosting the Nations Cup, which is a pretty interesting event featuring uh, mixed teams. Uh, each nation, uh, and or I think there's a Team Europe and a Team Rest of World, uh, bringing uh, three uh, players of any gender for the top three boards, and a female player as well. Uh, to each round, and I'm having a lot of fun following these games. Also notably, um, legendary chess player Levana Ronian is coming back to play in this tournament, and it's hard not to root for that guy. Uh, speaking of, he played a really great game uh, in one of these rounds of this Nations Cup. Now, uh, obviously I'm rooting for the United States as well, but in this game, Lenny A. Dominguez actually fell victim to Levana Ronian. And this is what gave me the idea for tonight's lecture topic. It is a game which features a very interesting attack on the king. Uh, however, it does so without uh, the queens. It is an attack on the king with the queens off of the board. And there are actually a ton of really fun games that really go to show uh, just because you get the queens off does not mean the game's going to be boring, does not mean the game's over, does not mean you're relegated to a boring end game. It just means you have all the other pieces to look out for. So why don't we uh, get into it pretty quickly here. We have e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, the Petrov. Uh, one of the main lines, we have d6, uh, knight f3, takes back on e4. Of course, well-known opening mistake is to take here on e4. Of course, you get met with queen e2, and things get a little more complex after the move queen e7 and queen takes e4 but uh, definitely not a good opening line. So black inserts this move, d6, to remove this knight from this e5 square before recapturing. Just a little Petrov background for you. Now white uh, claims the center with d4. This is more or less the main line. These days when players are really playing for an imbalanced position, trying to take out the Petrov, you'll see them play this nice uh, knight c3 move. It's a pretty interesting one. It is what Fabiano, I think, has been playing against the Petrov recently. Uh, and who knows uh, better how to beat the Petrov than uh, the Petrov's, uh, or one of the Petrov's finest players ever, uh, Fabiano Caruana. Of course, the idea is after takes, generally D takes, and you get some quick development with this bishop. Um, anyways, though, we don't see that in this game. We see D4. Black, of course, responds with D5, and you get this interesting fight for the center. Bishop D3 by white is trying to highlight that this knight cannot stay on the E4 square. We have bishop d6 by black, very symmetrical. Castles, castles. And then uh, this is where white really starts trying to prove that there is something to play for in this position. It looks kind of similar to maybe some exchange French positions that you guys might be familiar with. But of course, white's try for the advantage is not to develop calmly with moves like c3, but rather to challenge black's claim in the center with the move c4. And that is exactly what Lenny A. Dominguez does here. Now, after c6, this is kind of the one imbalance we're going to see in this position. White has this slightly extra queenside space with the pawn on c4, and black is on a slightly more defensive approach, uh, defending this pawn on d5 rather than going after white's pawn on d4 immediately. Uh, Lenny A continued with queen c2, and, uh, sorry, excuse me, Levon Aronian plays this move, h6. And this is really where Levon deviates from uh, the fairly standard theory here. This is a line that has actually been tried, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But h6 is an interesting way to just take away this g5 square from any of the white pieces. For example, if the move knight f6 were played on the previous turn, perhaps the move bishop g5 could even be uh, considered as a good move here. Moves like this, definitely. So h6 just takes away some of these squares, removes this pawn from the threat of capture, and gives black a little bit more freedom. 
Now, of course, the downside is you do just leave this knight on e4. Rather than capture medi me immediately, excuse me, Lenier plays the move rook e1, uh, Levon develops with bishop e6, and now after c takes d5, c takes d5, uh, Lenier says, enough is enough, you didn't defend your knight on e4, you didn't move it out of the way, I'm going to take your pawn. And he does exactly that. And this is the interesting position that Levon Aronian got out of the opening. Now, this one, I think, is fairly new stuff. I did manage to find uh, one uh, game, at least in this position, uh, that actually went pretty terribly for black. Black kind of got demolished there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that once we get to where we deviated from that game. So thus far, we are actually following exactly a game from the 2020 Moscow Open that was played by two players by the name of Abdu Sadarov and Sadwani. Uh, so for those curious, we'll take a look at that as well. Uh, Levon continues with the very nice move, Bishop d5. And this is where you kind of start to see Black's compensation uh, appearing. White has an extra pawn. It is this extra d4 pawn. In the meantime, Black is getting some immediate play with these bishops. Now this queen steps over to g4. And Black now continues with a rather counterintuitive move. Uh, generally, you would expect with these nice looking bishops on the open board uh, and being down a pawn, Black would want to keep the ladies on the board. But this game goes to show you, uh, as will the other games tonight, that queens are not required to launch an attack on the king. So here, white's queen is actually a far more active piece than black's queen, and so it is just objectively the best move to play queen d7 and trade those queens. Now we have queen takes d7, knight takes d7, nothing really better for white. Uh, moving the queen over to h4 doesn't really make a ton of sense. And now knight c3 by white. Um, it is conceivable that you could play a move like knight e5, but you're just going to run into one or two threats like rook e8, pinning this knight, uh, and at the end of the day, you might even end up giving a pawn back if you're not super careful. So instead, knight c3 was Lenier Dominguez's choice. Now the obvious downside to this move is bishop takes f3 and g takes f3. And this is where uh, Levon Aronian deviates from this game that was played at the Moscow Open. Now, uh, I can't speak with 100% certainty for the players, but I'm pretty sure they were both well aware of this game as they uh, tend to keep up on the relevant games happening around the world, these top grandmasters do. So let's take a look at what happened in that other game first, and maybe that can help us understand how Levon Aronian decided to play this position. So in the other game between uh, Abdu Sadarov and Sadwani, uh, rook f d8 was played. Uh, it's a perfectly natural move. Uh, black wants to get opposite this pawn on d4. Uh, white plays the move bishop e3. Black starts to reroute this knight to f8, looking for perhaps this f4 square. Uh, white plays rook e d1, another natural move, supporting the pawn from behind. And then after a few more moves, knight g6, rook c1, rook c8, well, now white comes on the board with this move, uh, knight e4. And the fact of the matter is, after takes on c1 and takes on c1, this bishop is just in the way for black. And black now spends time moving it back to b8, spends a full tempo doing so. And now after knight c5, b6, knight b7, well, it's, it's going to turn out that this bishop is in the way again. The black rook would love to stay on this file. It needs to stay on this file to guard against this pawn advancing. But now it simply cannot because of the awkward placement of this dark squared bishop. So now rook f8, and after d5, white went on to win a very, very nice game here that I'll show you just super quickly. This pawn just comes up the board. Uh, the white pieces are in total control, and this d pawn is a huge thorn in black's side. White then sacrificed a rook on c7, and at the end of the day, these two pawns ended up uh, being far too much for black to handle. Uh, I'll let you guys analyze that one on your own time. But white did go on to, to win this endgame fairly easily, using these super far advanced pawns. So that brings us back to this position here. Now, if you remember, what was played in that other game that I just showed was rook d8 and some moves like this. And what happened was, uh, this knight came into e4, hit this bishop, this bishop went back to b8, and that bishop ended up uh, being a little bit of a target for white. 
So if you're Levon Aronian here, having seen this game uh, previously, having perhaps done some homework, what do you think the move is that you're going to come up with here? You've seen how some of these games kind of transpire here uh, when things go poorly for black. So what can you do to solve some of these problems uh, in this position? What can be done? Well, getting a lot of positive feedback in the chat. It's great to hear that you guys are always improving at chess. Of course, you can't uh, attribute that to any one source. It's just you get better at chess with time. You just get better with time. Why not bishop b4, says kite123. And that's exactly right. Levon Aronian plays this move bishop e4. And at first glance, it looks counterintuitive, right? Because superficially, this is a really great bishop on d6. It's standing in the way of this pawn. It's keeping pressure on this isolated h2 pawn. It's guarding some queen side squares. Uh, and this knight, at first glance, doesn't really uh, give too big of an impression. But in fact, Levon Aronian correctly surmises that this knight is going to be worth more than bishop than this bishop in this position. So this bishop simply gets in the way, as we've seen from practical experience. So bishop b4 is the move that Levon Aronian comes up with here, just removing this bishop from the threat of capture and uh, ensuring that this knight is not going to be as big of a problem as we saw in that previous game. So bishop b4 is a great move by Levon Aronian. Uh, let's see, bishop d2 comes on the board, and now Levon continues with rook f to d8. Uh, note that while we do want to get rid of our uh, bishop being in our own way, we're not really interested in fixing white's pawn structure like this, so Levon definitely not going to make that trade. So after rook d8, uh, Lenny uh, continued in a similar way to the previous game with the move knight e4, perhaps trying to get this knight active. The good news now for Levon is he's gotten rid of this annoying bishop on d6. He's gotten rid of the target for this knight. So this knight now uh, comes with much less threatening, with a much less threatening presence. In fact, Levon simply trades on d2, and this knight is relegated back to this d2 square uh, for the moment in a purely uh, defensive posture. Uh, so Levon uh, solving these opening problems in a really interesting way. Uh, and I hope you guys at home can take away a little something from that. If you play your own games, uh, that's the most common way to, to kind of gain this kind of experience. You don't necessarily have to study all of the games that, that go on. But if you see a line played in a super tournament in a line that, that you're familiar with, a line that you play yourself, and it goes poorly for your side, it's definitely worth taking a look at that game, seeing what went wrong for uh, the side that lost, and seeing if you need to amend uh, your own openings uh, in return. So that's exactly what Levon Aronian does here. He sees this game happen, he sees what went wrong for black, and so he, he solves this problem. And then he tries it out in his own game with great success. So especially in your own games, if you end up losing, uh, getting a bad position out of the opening, try and understand why that happened, and try and see uh, if you need to uh, make some changes to, to what you're playing. And that's the really instructive thing from Levon Aronian here. Noticing that this bishop is a bad piece and getting rid of it before it becomes a problem. Now, Levon is free to continue with the move knight f6, and in stark contrast to the last game, it is only black who controls the d5 square, and thus, with the pawn stuck back on d4, it's going to be a much bigger weakness than it is uh, an advantage. You know, it's not ever threatening the queen if it can't ever cross the d5 square. That being said, black is still down a pawn, so all is not totally well. Now the move knight b3 comes on the board for white, and I'd like you guys to try and guess Levon Aronian's next move. It's a very natural move. It's another very instructive move. So I'll leave it to you guys to try and find this one. I always want to hang on to my bishops old school. Well. Uh, that's that's fine, but if you know in a particular position that your bishop is simply a target, then that's when you can start trying to think, well, maybe I shouldn't be, be holding on to this guy. Okay, 
I've given you guys some time to think. There are some various ideas in the chat. A5 is one suggestion. Rook c8, knight d5. Uh, two of those are really natural moves, really instructive moves. This a5 move is something I've recommended in the past against knights on b3. And the reason I've recommended it is because with the move a5, you often threaten to shake this knight loose and force it to, to squares it doesn't want to go to. The difference here is that, in fact, the knight does have a square it, it wants to get to immediately. So with the move a5, you're actually just increasing the power of this move knight c5. Remember that last game. This knight went to c5 and to b7, and then white ended up winning the game with, with some finesse. Um, so I don't know if knight c5 would be the move immediately, but perhaps it is just a little bit too slow. For example, if rook c1 or rook e7 even got played, then after a4, this knight's going to step here, going to start creating some threats of its own. Remember, this is, in fact, actually an extra pawn for white. So if you play b6 and knight e4, white is not super upset about ending up in, in some position like this, where probably this is, this is just going to be a draw, but white does have a slight edge in rook activity here. It's going to take you some time to get this rook on a8 into the action. Um, maybe white even has better there. But I don't uh, totally love that move a5. The move Levon went for is a move I did see suggested in the chat. It's just the move b6. Uh, this knight comes to b3. It has two squares that it can potentially hop to. And the move b6 takes away both of them. It's a great preventative way to play against knights. Um, there's some famous quote. I don't remember how it goes or who said it. So probably I shouldn't have brought it up. But it's about playing against knights. The way to play against knights is to take away their outpost to take away their forward advancing moves. If they can't advance, then they become rather passive, rather worthless, uh, as is this knight stuck on b3. And that's really the, the difference of the story of this game versus the story of that first game we, we branched off to, to look at from the Moscow Open. This knight is now an awful, awful piece, and this knight is now free to wreak havoc. Rook ac1 is white's choice, a totally natural move. Now, uh, of course, white is trying to invade on the seventh rank. Black plays a very nice move, knight d5. Uh, very preventative chess from Levon Aronian here, and it's, it's working with great effect. White kind of finds himself without much to do. And as such, white plays this next move, a3. Obviously, not the most impressive move. Uh, perhaps Lenny is playing with a similar strategy of preventing the knight's forward maneuvers. Of course, a3 is keeping an eye on the b4 square. This knight not going to land there anymore. But of course, this knight has other options uh, as well. And this is black's compensation, this weakness on the king's side. Uh, when you get a weakness in structure like this, it's not necessarily always about being able to capture these pawns. It's about the squares that are weakened by it. These h3, h4, f4 squares, even the f3 square, all become very, very weakened when the g pawn disappears. So a3. Uh, now. Just more natural chess by Levon Aronian. Rook d6. You lift this rook, you prepare to double, you increase, increase the pressure on d4, and you even potentially hint at going after the king. Don't forget the topic of this lecture. So rook e4, uh, played by white, uh, a natural move, guards this, e pawn, or guards this d pawn, rather, and perhaps hints at some defensive ability uh, moving laterally. Rook a d8 now. And Lenier, sensing uh, some danger on the king's side, tries this move, king f1, to uh, get a little bit closer to the center. Now, you guys at home did have a good idea. I just didn't like the order you put it in. So b6 first prevents this knight's forward hops. And now the move a5 does come on the board with threats of a4, threats of kicking away this knight. So that was, in fact, a good positional idea. You just have to get the order right sometimes. Uh, now, of course, a4 uh, would be a really good move for uh, black, for example. If white just passes, then a4, knight back, knight f6, and this pawn is already going to fall. So white plays a4 himself, uh, simply for preventing this idea. Now, of course, the downside to this is it gives up another, another horsey hop, another hop for this horsey. Now, if you're Levon Aronian, it is your time to shine here. Uh, so try and come up with another really great positional move by Levon Aronian. This is how 
attacks are created, not by superficial threats, but by gaining positional edges around the king, by gaining uh, positional advantages, and then transferring them uh, into a, a concrete attack, a material edge, an advantage in activity, these, these things. And this is what Levon does so expertly in this game. So black to move, what can you come up with? What is the topic? The topic is attacks without the queens. Attacks without the queens. Ah, the chat is, is filling me in on my horrible misquotes earlier. Uh, the quote about playing against knights, apparently that is by Steinitz. I just remember the content. I don't remember any, any of the specifics. Uh, so I'm a, I'm at uh, Gesus says f5 Toblerone also says f5, uh, and yeah f5 is actually not not the worst idea here. This rook is on a pretty nice square stationed on e4, and you would very much like to kick this rook off of this square. Uh, I think the problem here for Black is that f5 actually gives up a more critical square than e4. Of course, by pushing this pawn, you give up more squares. Now with f6 uh, being illegal, rook e5, I think, is just going to be a very nice, very active square for this rook. And you might have actually hemmed yourself in with a little bit of a weakness here. Note, we don't really want this pawn on f4, because it's taking away this square from some other pieces that might use it to better effect. So not f5 here, not f5. Um, Subakura seems to have it. Uh, a lot of people saying KB4, I'm assuming meaning Knight B4. Knight B4 is going to come uh, at some point in the game. But I think first, this move, G5, should be played, as was mentioned in the chat. Uh, so G5 is a really, really great positional move. It is locking down this weakness on, uh, on F3 here, locking down this F4 square and ensuring that white is going to be saddled with these double pawns for quite a while. If you do play some move like knight b4, I'm not sure if you can really do it immediately, but perhaps white can start considering moves like f4 himself, trying to get a little bit of extra space with this pawn over here, make it actually useful for something. Moves like knight d3 are probably what you had on your mind, uh, but even here, uh, I think white can start considering moves like, like rook c7, giving up this b2 pawn and, and going for some shenanigans. Actually, uh, I, I'm second guessing myself now. Probably the move rook c2 would have to be played. And perhaps, you know, the more I look at it, the more I like your guys' knight b4 move. After knight b4, uh, white probably has to stop knight d3, if I had to guess. And then maybe you could continue with g5. But I like the move g5 immediately. Not saying knight b4 is a bad move. The more I look at it, it actually does seem totally reasonable. But the, the positional way, the principled way to play, is this move g5, locking down the f4 square and these two weak pawns on f3 and f2. White now is uh, in a purely defensive posture and plays the move rook c4, simply overprotecting this pawn, stepping out of perhaps these same knight d3 tricks that you guys were trying to enact. Uh, now, King G7, a simple improving move from Levon, takes his time here. He has a really great positional bind, and so he is playing it slowly, letting his opponents uh, make some more decisions. And this is another thing that, that Super Grandmasters will do that is slightly difficult to replicate. They'll, uh, if I can make more quotes, they'll give you enough rope to, uh, to hang yourself with, uh, if I can use a brutal quote. Uh, so. Levon Aronian does a really mean thing with King G7, where he says, hey, it's your turn, play a move. <laughs> uh, and so, of course, uh, Lenier does play a move with Rook E1. Uh, Levon now continues taking his time, just plays King uh, to G6, playing more improving moves. And now, after Knight D2, perhaps this was one retreating move too many for Lenier Dominguez. Uh, Levon Aronian now springs into action with the move Knight B4, as you guys were suggesting. It is a great move, spying some real weaknesses in the white camp. And at this point, it comes with the added bonus of attacking a D4 pawn as well. So uh, Knight B3 
was uh, Lenny Ace Choice just bringing the knight back to defend this pawn. But now knight d3 does come on the board, rook e2, and now knight f4 comes with tempo. So just a little bit of finesse there. Rather than come to knight f4 immediately, he comes here with tempo, comes here with tempo, and then comes here with tempo. So at the end of the day, uh, Levon Aronian gaining a tempo by making the full circle. So rook e1 comes on the board. And now let me ask you, you're Levon Aronian. You seem to have improved your pieces to uh, you know almost the max here, right? You've doubled the rooks in front of the weak, isolated d pawn. You've brought your knight to the most active square on f4. Uh, it can come to d3 whenever it likes, harassing this rook. Your opponent has just repeated moves, essentially, you know, saying, "All right, all right, man, uh, you you got me here. Let's let's uh, let's repeat." So the task is now on you to come up with a way to increase the pressure to continue playing for a win. So try and come up uh, both with a specific move and perhaps with, with an improving plan idea for black here. How do you try to win this game? How do you try to win this game? How would Magnus have won this? Probably, uh, hopefully in a similar fashion to Levon, because Levon played it very, very well. So I'm seeing some specific moves. What about long term? Where do you want all these pieces long term? And feel free to be a little bit unrealistic about this. Now, I know I'm asking for a ton of people to say, well, put the rook on h1. But, you know, uh, long term plans, long term plans. We know this is a weakness. We know this is a weakness. Perhaps b2 is even a little bit of a weakness. Are there any weaknesses that we're kind of neglecting to mention? Weaknesses that look, at first glance, slightly difficult to get to, but also seem even more difficult to defend. There's one point in particular that Levon Aronian really focuses on here. So I'm seeing some moves now, rook f6, rook d5, rook, well rook d4 is a, a bit much, okay, looks like that was the typo, he meant rook d5. Uh, knight back to d3, well that would be repeating, this is the position we just had, and then uh, Levon brought the knight to f4. Knight e6 puts more pressure on the d-pawn to be sure, however, uh, I, I will let you in on a little secret, um, I don't think this is going to be uh, a winning end game, unfortunately. This one looks to be rather drawn. So just winning the d-pawn is not going to be enough here. So these ideas of f5 and h5 I think are actually doing a little bit more harm than they are good. It's nice to have a little bit of shelter for your king at the very least. And then rather than do things the traditional way, uh, of attacking on a side of the board where you push the pawns forward and you like increase the pressure with the pieces behind. Levon chooses to put the pieces in front of the pawns here. And this is kind of a feature of a position with slightly less pieces on the board. You know, if there's a ton of bishops and knights on the board, it doesn't make so much sense to strand your rooks out in front of your pawns. But with a single pair of knights and two rooks on the board, uh, this type of strategy can work very well. It's a nice little feature of these types of positions with slightly less pieces where it, it does give the attacking side actually a little bit more freedom to go a little bit wild. So as someone said, h2 is a weakness. This is the one that I was really hoping you guys would get. So Levon starts to enact a plan where instead of keeping this knight on f4, he imagines, well what if I had my rook on h4? What happens then? With a rook on h4, suddenly things become very, very awkward for my opponent to defend this h2 pawn. King g1 is really the only way, and then you can really imagine uh, rook number 2 joining the party, and all of a sudden things get, get a little bit crazy. So the first move to start with, as a lot of you said, is going to be this move, rook f6, spying this f3 pawn. Knight d2 is Lenier Dominguez's choice, trying to keep an eye on this guy. Now we see Levon play the very nice move, knight d3, hitting these two guys. Rook e2, slightly more natural way of defending, does not work anymore due to the placement of this knight. So rook b1 instead, and then Levon wastes no time. Uh, rook to f4 is his move. Now, uh, as often happens in chess, there is no victory without risk. 
Rook f4 is, of course, actually risking quite a bit here. It's allowing white to play this move, Rook c6 check. Now the king steps back to g7, and Rook takes b6. So uh, white taking off this b6 pawn. In return, of course, black is getting this d4 pawn. Uh, and now white plays a, a slightly nonchalant move here that really does uh, more or less se secure his fate. Uh, perhaps slightly better for white, uh, a better try would be to play a sacrifice with this move uh, pawn to b4. Now if we get knight takes b4, white can try knight b3, for example rook d3, knight a5, and white's going to end up with uh, an a pawn. You know, it's not a lot, but it is an a pawn. You know, something to play for to counteract black's huge pressure on the king's side. It also has the added bonus of getting rid of black's final pawn on this queen side. Instead, uh, Lenny and Dominguez plays this uh, slightly, you know, soft move, as they say, uh, pawn to b3. Uh, just a little bit too slow for what this position calls for here. So now, if you're Levonaronian, it's time to start finding some knockout punches. So what is the big tactic for black here? Big tactic for black. Toblerone says white is dead here. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Knight takes f2 is, in fact, the tactic played in the game. Uh, and now black is actually uh, reached material equality and taken away, actually, what is a key defender in the, the white camp. With this f2 pawn gone, things start to become very awkward for this white king. Of course, if you take on f2, black will regain the piece immediately on d2, take over here on h2, perhaps, and with the entire king side falling, this is going to be a very good end game for black. And in fact, uh, I dare say it is just going to be a, a pretty simple win. For example, rook b5 would probably mean rook h3. If you don't defend this guy, I'll take both of these pawns. If you do defend this guy, um, I might even play this move. I, I don't know if I will play this move. Uh, these end games are a little above my head. Uh, instead, though, uh, a better try for white is what was played in the game, the move king e2, defending this knight. Now, uh, I'm sure all of you guys at home can find the move here. If you want to take a second to try it, you're welcome to. But, of course, I'm revealing it now. The move is rook h4, as we said earlier. This h2 pawn, a devastating weakness in the white camp. The white king is really the only piece that was capable of defending this square. And now that it has vacated to e2, h2 is quite simply... Uh, falling. White puts in the effort though with knight to f1 and now it's just a question of coordinating black's remaining pieces to attack this white king. Levon does so uh, very masterfully. He plays knight d3 heading back for the f4 square. Rook b5 means knight f4 with a check. King f2 is white's choice trying to keep an eye on this trying to perhaps run back all the way to the king's side. And now rook d1 really highlights how strong these three remaining pieces for black are. Uh, a knight on f4 is devastating. The rook's now coordinating together to get at f3, and white is totally busted here. Rook e5 was Lenier Dominguez's try. And now uh, I will let you actually at home Try and find Levon Aronian's next move. What is Levon Aronian's next move and why? Uh, hopefully, you guys at home can spy this one. It's, it's a pretty fun move, actually. It's a pretty fun move. It's a pretty fun one. It's, it's a slick one. All right, I'm not going to wait the full delay for the chat to find it. Uh, I'll trust you guys. It is, of course, the move rook c3. This is a, a fantastic move. Um, of course, uh, the problem for black 
you can't get at this king on the second rank. This knight is guarding both of these entry points. So what does Levon do? Well, his opponent just played rook e5, so he says, okay, I'll play rook c3. Now, you can go ahead and solve this threat and this threat. You know, take, take your time. It's, it's all you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, of course, Lenny A. Dominguez can't solve both of these threats. He plays rook takes a5, and rather than the immediate check with some escaping chances, perhaps, uh, out one way or, or the other for this, uh, for this white king, Lenny A, or sorry, Levant simply plays rook h3, hitting this f3 pawn. Now, rook b5 was Lenny A's move, and of course, this pawn is just falling. Rook takes f3, king g1, now rook c2 comes on the board, and this king is dead. This king is just dead. Rook b6, rook f, f2, a5, rook g2 check, king h1, and the final move of the game, uh, the devastating mating net. Does everybody see it? It is, of course, the move knight h3. With the dual threat of rook g1 checkmate, and if this knight moves out of the way, rook takes h2 checkmate. Levon Aronian taking down Lenny Dominguez in this very exciting Nations Cup uh, battle here. Uh, I had a lot of fun analyzing this game, uh, and it really shows how to coordinate the pieces um, around this king side weakness here. You know, a lot of players I think would get to this point and and end up just quite simply drawing here. It looks like white has successfully defended all of the weak points. B d4 is defended. B2 is well enough defended by this rook. He's got this open file. He's got chances for his own activity if you get a little bit too crazy. But Levon coming up with some maneuvers to really uh, take out Lenny A. Dominguez here. It was, all, it was a very, very fun game. So that is the first game I wanted to show you guys. We spent quite a while on it because it was a really gr great one. Why don't we move on to another game featuring a queenless attack. Now this is one by two uh, fantastic Hungarian chess players. Uh, from a long time back, this was the 1984 Hungarian Chess Championship, I believe. Uh, it was a game between uh, Portish and Pinter. Uh, probably not saying either of no those names correctly, but uh, Portish was, of course, a uh, world-class player from Hungary back in the 80s. He competed in the Candidates Tournament, I think, multiple times. He earned himself the nickname the Hungarian Botvinnik, I think, from my Wikipedia research prior to this uh, class. Uh, and his opponent, uh, Pinter, was no pushover either. Pinter, a multiple-time Hungarian champion. So why don't we see what happened in this game? Of course, it started d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, d5, knight c3, and we have the Tarash game with the move c5. Uh, black immediately challenging white's claim to the center in the most combative way possible. Now, of course, what commonly happens in these structures is somebody ends up with an isolated pawn. In this case, after c takes d5, we have knight takes d5, e4, claiming the center, knight takes c3, b takes c3, c takes d4, c takes d4. And with the way that uh, both sides have played, there's not technically an isolated pawn on d4, but rather we get a, a Grunfeld type of structure uh, where Black has not really committed this bishop to the g7 square, uh, and has also committed this pawn to the e6 square. And so this does change a few things about this structure. For one, uh, of course, the move bishop g4 is now highly illegal. Can't play that one. Uh, secondly, the pressure on the d4 pawn uh, superficially seems like it's been lessened by this bishop not being on g7. But in fact, uh, black does create some mounting threats against this pawn anyways, with threats like bishop b4 check. In fact, bishop b4 is, in fact, the main move here, uh, in fact. But instead, knight c6 played in this game with the threat of bishop b4 to follow. White chooses the line with uh, bishop c4, and then black gets to play a really fun move here. Uh, that is the move b5. So, of course, b5, if bishop captures, there is a fork. So after b5, this bishop simply steps back to e2, and now black does continue with this move, bishop b4 check. After bishop d2, you can't quite tactically justify taking this guy just yet, because it does leave your bishop on b4 hanging. So queen a5 played in the game. We have bishop takes b4 check by white. 
Definitely not the most common move here. This is probably where modern theory uh, more or less diverges. Uh, there is a, a really fun move, d5 for black, that has been played. Rook b1 is also commonly played. The move a4 as well kind of highlights that b5 may have been just a, just a touch premature by black here. But instead, bishop takes b4 is quite simplifying. Uh, after queen d2, we have bishop b7. a3 forces the queen trade on black or white's terms, rather. We have takes on d2, takes on d2 and a6, uh, solidifying this pawn on b5. And this is the queenless middle game that we have arrived at here. And so now the, the question for black is going to be, how do you try and take advantage of this slightly exposed king sitting on d2? Your queen is off the board, so it's going to be a much more difficult task than, uh, than normal. So the, the way to go about it here for black is simply to think about ways to open files. Your rooks are your heavy hitting pieces that you have left. So you want to find ways to get your, rook into the, your rooks into the game, uh, specifically to get at the white king. In the game, uh, white starts with the move a4, breaking down this queenside structure a little bit further. And after b4, uh, white tries a, a pretty interesting move here. Uh, after a4, if white just plays a normal move, like rook c1, perhaps, um, sorry, yeah, let's, let's actually say like rook d1 instead, perhaps the move a5 is, is going to be good for black here. The idea being, you shore up this protected pass pawn on the queen side, and that's going to be a, a more or less permanent advantage that black can have going into this end game. Uh, however, the move rook hc1 might do a good enough job of preventing this with threats like bishop b5 and d5 to follow, even knight e5 coming on the board here. So perhaps rook hc1 was slightly more accurate. a5 uh, also, of course, attempts to stop the move a5 from black uh, simply by making it illegal. You know, that one works as well. So now we have this interesting dynamic over here. Both sides kind of saddled with a weakness, but we'll see that uh, black's weakness actually turns out to be quite useful for him with some nice control of the c3 square. Uh, black continues now with the move rook d8. Uh, like I said, it's all about the rooks here. Black is looking to find ways to get at this king to rip open this d file. The move king e3 comes on the board. And now if you've been paying attention, you'll realize that I've been saying over and over again, it's all about opening files. So with that big hint in mind, I'm going to leave it to you guys at home to find black's next move. How did black open files in this game? How did he do it? Jim is suggesting short castle. Rook d8 with king e7, maybe? Okay, nobody yet has spied the move. Okay, Raj seems to have the move. It is, of course, the nice move f5. This is the highly combative move by black to open up files in front of the kings, to get the rooks into the game, to take advantage of this king's exposed nature, it even, in fact, opens up this diagonal for the bishop as well. This is the activity-gaining move played by black. Now, of course, this is the type of move that you only want to play under special circumstances. Uh, this is one of those special circumstances. f5 is a hugely weakening move, and the number of drawbacks that come with playing a move like f5 often outweigh the, the number of advantages that come as well. For example, here, you have to have a plan for what happens uh, on the move at, uh, e5. So hopefully you all at home see the plan for black after e5. It is, of course, uh, just to play this move f4, divert this king from the d4 pawn, and this is going to be uh, pretty nice for black. You can even keep the pressure up with a move like g5, threatening f4 at a later date. So e5 leaves this d-pawn behind. That's why that one's not getting played. And so this weak e6 pawn is not going to stay on e6 for long. e takes f5, played in the game. Uh, e takes f5 by black as well. And now the nice move, bishop c4. 
Uh, and now this is where the game kind of turns into a, a special one. This is kind of why this one is a classic. Black's next move actually is fairly natural. Bishop c4 prevents castling. Black needs to get this rook into the game, so Black plays the move king e7. Um, now, uh, I'm going to kind of give it away by telling you that uh, Black played a really cool move here, but White plays the move d5, trying to use this d-pawn to his advantage. And now I'd like you guys at home to uh, try and find Black's next move here, because it is uh, a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun what Black did in this game. It's a lot of fun what Black came up with here. What do you guys got? What do you guys got for me? Okay, Rook takes d5 is a little bit much. It's a little bit much. Giving up a big one there. Giving up a big one. Can't can't do that one. Can't do that one. Okay, looks like some people do have it now. The move Rook e8 is actually what might be the best move. It has an identical idea to the move that was played in the game. Uh, king f6 with the idea of rook e8 to follow. So black simply sacrifices this entire knight here on c6, gets this rook into the game, and after king e4, see if you can find the correct follow-up for black. What is the follow-up here? You've sacrificed your knight. Are you simply going to recapture this piece? Is this what you're going to settle for? I, I wonder. I wonder what you guys at home have up your sleeves. All right, I'm not going to wait too long in this one. Don't want too many uh, huge pauses. So, of course, the move played in the game is rook e4 check, going after this king immediately and getting a losing position. So, rook e4 check was actually a slight misstep in the game by black. The best move is actually the really fun move g5 check here. The idea being, you're quite happy with where this rook is already, and this is the rook that you want to get into the attack. So g5 uh, is, uh, sorry, distracting this knight, that's the word, couldn't come up with it for a second, away from the d4 square. And after a move like rook d4 check now, if you step here, bishop takes c6 is check. If you step here, rook, um, rook g4 is check. And after king takes, you can even play uh, bishop takes c6 here. Uh, with some threats against, uh, sorry, this pawn on g2, as well as this knight sitting here on, uh, on the g5 square. And it's going to be rather difficult for uh, white to handle all, all of these threats. For example, if knight f3, uh, oh, well, that, that also, the bishop's hanging as well. Don't forget that the bishop's hanging as well. So that was actually the best line. Rook e4 played in the game instead. And after king g3, uh, white just might be getting away with it. Now, Black does a really fun thing here. Rather than recapture on c6, he notices that the king's only saved squares seem to be on this diagonal right now. And so the move bishop c8 is what uh, Black comes up with. A great practical try here. Rook a c1 by white guarding this bishop on c4. Now we have rook g4 check, king h3, and f4. Now, there is only one way to win the game for white here. So far, white has defended well against this huge sacrifice here, but you have to come up with a really special line now in order to win this game. So you guys at home, I encourage you to try and pause your videos here. Try and find the way. Find the way to survive with white. Uh, and not only survive, but in fact, end up winning this game. Note that if you play like any move, at the very least, um, there's going to be this nice perpetual check for black. Not to say black wouldn't have more after a move like bishop e2, but at the very least, there's this perpetual check. So your task with white is to stop this check, as well as to, uh, you know, win the game. <laughs> so not only survive, but also, but also win. Uh, so bishop takes a6 actually does not do it for the same reason I just mentioned. This double check 
uh, is going to be a draw. The lion actually goes one, uh, the move c7. This rook will move out of the way. Uh, if you start giving these checks, king h4, rook h5, well now, uh, white can actually consider in this position uh, simply running up the board. Simply running up the board, of course. Uh, white couldn't do that in this line because here the move rook d5 was going to be checkmate without this bishop's support. So c7, um, and the white king can run up the board if you try to give these checks. If you move the rook, then this move, bishop e6, is the killer point by, uh, by white here. You interfere with the bishop's communication with this rook. If rook takes, well now king takes g4, wins this rook. If bishop takes, another killer move by white, rook c6, pins this bishop to the king. Now uh, these threats still do not work due to this rook being interfered with, so you can give these checks, but the white king will still run up, and rook takes e6 is going to be an unstoppable threat. Really crazy stuff there. That is the only line that actually wins the game for white. Understandably, this was missed. Knight e5 played instead. And this is a, a pretty fun one here. It tries to avoid these perpetuals by guarding the g4 square. Uh, but now, uh, black plays not the best move, but definitely the, the most fun here. So black to move now. Black to move and win. Black to move and win. I'll show you the best line and also the line that, that was played in the game. A disgusting engine line, well, uh, I mean, it is just the, the only way to win, which makes it fun in my opinion. Of course, it's going to be a difficult one for uh, humans to see, but bishop e6 is uh, really a beautiful beautiful move. You, you can call it disgusting, you can call it beautiful, but uh, it's, it's pretty crazy stuff, and that's, that's what I like to see. Bishop e6, just planting this bishop in the way. So rook g3 check is actually going to be checkmate here. King h4, and there's only one move that wins. This is, in fact, the best line. Uh, and this is a, a really fun move as well. Uh, if you've noticed, this rook would love to come checkmate the white king. Uh, however, there's a pawn in the way. So the old, well, I guess, okay, sorry. Rook g6 wins as well. I didn't notice this at first. But the best winning line is to play h5, with the idea being, after white's next move, you're going to play g5, force the white king to take your own piece, and then rook h8 is checkmate. And the engine actually just says h5 is, is simply checkmate in 6 here. Knight g6 is somehow the best move, guarding against this, I guess. And then you're going to end up uh, in the same fate shortly after a few checks. So h5, killer move there. Uh, however, if you don't see that, hopefully you guys at home came up with the move played in the game. Uh, yeah, some of you have it. It is the nice move, king g5. Uh, defending this rook, using the king as an attacker. We love to see it. Uh, now, if knight takes rook, bishop takes is a checkmate. Knight f7 check, played instead. King h5 keeps this king in the attack. Of course, with the queens off the board, uh, perhaps black was thinking, you know, why not bring the other monarch into the attack? And that's exactly what he does here. And now, uh, white is simply dead. He comes up with the only try, bishop e2, and now uh, I'm sure you all at home can see the win here for black. There's only one. There's only one win once again. Once again, a crazy position. All right. Hopefully you guys at home see it. Of course, you need to unpin your rook or else you might, in fact, lose this game. So rook d3, check, trying to divert this bishop away from the defense of the king. If bishop takes, rook g3 is a double check mate. Note that your nice attacking king has taken away the only flight square for the white king. So you cannot take g3 played in the game. And now another really great move uh, by uh, Pinter here is the move f3. <laughs> uh, once again, just taking away the only flight square available to this king. Now if bishop takes rook, rook h4 is going to be the checkmate with this square taken away as well as the g3 square taken away. Uh, the only move to keep the game going was actually bishop takes f3. When after rook takes f3 and king g2 for example, rook takes uh, f7 
and black is just going to be up a, a full piece. So understandably, white did not go for this line. Instead, giving rook c5 check. Now, of course, rook g5 is check, counter, check. g4 is check, counter, check, counter, check. Bishop takes g4 is check, counter, 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 check. Um, king g3, and now f takes g2 check was enough for resignation from, uh, from white here. If king g2, bishop h3 is checkmate. If you play king f4, well, then rook takes c5 is uh, winning enough winning enough so that's a fun end to the game there rook c5 check rook g5 counter check g4 counter counter check bishop takes g4 counter 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 check uh, to in fact win this game uh, so just to show you the power of getting out a check with check there really really fun game here but between portish and pinter a hungarian classic i'm willing to say perhaps our current resident gm Denis boros uh, is familiar with this game as well all right, there's five minutes left in the show. There was one question about this game that I did want to talk about. Uh, back here, I believe, I asked you guys for ways to open up lines here, and someone suggested the move g5. g5, uh, I mean, it's, it's a nice idea trying to provoke knight takes g5, and this, in fact, would be uh, pretty nice for black to get the center pawn for the g pawn, but white simply doesn't have to take this, and in fact, after the move h3, um, this, this square is, is well guarded, and then you're going to have to continue with f5 anyways if you want to achieve anything. And these threats aren't going away, so g5, not uh, totally ideal there. Uh, okay, with that in mind, we have four minutes left. I wanted to pull up a final position for you guys. This is, of course, a game between Mikhail Tal and Evgeny Mukin. Perhaps Mukin thinking he could get away uh, with the draw against Tal by trading queens early. They arrived at this position. Okay, I just gave it away. This position, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, e5 was a killer move by Tal to open up the d-file. And after bishop takes, or bishop to c5, I'm hoping you guys at home can find one last final tactic. Play like Tal, checkmate the king without the queens on the board here. What can you do? Okay, one last puzzle for you guys at home before we, we go away here. Yeah, you don't see counter, counter, counter check in every game. You, you got that one right. Got that one right. Uh, so, of course, the move for everybody at home is not to trade bishops, but to play rook takes d3. And this is the, the killer blow by Tal here. He sees all these pieces lined up on this d file. He gets ready for it. He says, I want to kill this king. e5 forces this bishop away, either by takes or bishop c5. And now rook takes d3 is, is the killer blow. King takes d3, uh, the only move really for uh, white here. If you take here, well, bishop b5 comes on the board anyways, and this knight is going to die. So king takes d3, bishop b5 is check. King c2, now knight a4, increases the pressure to this bishop. King b3, b6, forces this bishop away. If bishop takes here, well, that's going to be a checkmate uh, by my math. Is my math correct? My math is, is correct enough. It's, it's going to be checkmate uh, eventually with bishop d3. Um, so instead, knight c4 after takes, takes, rook c1, knight to c5 check, king takes b4, a6 is the move that forced resignation in this final game that I wanted to show you guys. Of course, uh, the threat is more or less unstoppable. And what is the threat, I hear you asking? It is, of course, knight d3 check with uh, just, just winning all all of the rooks. Pretty hard to stop. If you do move this rook out of the way, well then still knight d3 check and, and knight takes e5 is, is going to be enough for Tal. So didn't have a ton of time to show you guys this last game, just wanted to introduce that, that kind of final fun tactic. I recommend checking out that game between Evgeny Mukin and Mikhail Tal on your own time if you're interested. Um, that is going to do it for tonight on the road to 2000. Hopefully you guys enjoyed these uh, queenless attacks, these fun checkmating attacks without the queens on the board. I had a great time analyzing these games. Um, that is going to do it for me on this class tonight. If you're watching live, stay tuned for the end game class coming up directly after. If you're watching the recorded version, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time. Yeah.